on this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. I think we need both in the Christian world. We need people who are modeling excellent making of art and culture, and also people who are modeling excellent consumption of art and culture. And artists need great um, audiences in order to spur them on to raise the bar in their own craft. And of course, audiences need high quality art to, to keep inspiring them. And My guest is Brett McCracken, Senior Editor of the Gospel Coalition. Brett oversees the content related to culture and the arts, and his favorite art form is film. Brett isn't just a self-made cinephile. He studied film at UCLA, and he knows his stuff. And he's here with me to talk about Christian film. This is episode 17. We're on a mission from God. Most moviegoers are passionate about film, and they're very opinionated about what they like and don't like. Even the best of critics disagree dramatically with one another about the merits of any particular film. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see the same thing in Christian film. We can fall into an error of being hypersensitive about criticism. But in Christian film, there's an added degree of opinion that other genres don't have. And that's that we have a vested interest in Christian films because, whether we like it or not, they represent our faith and who we are as disciples of Christ. And we don't like it when our faith is badly represented, handled poorly, or made to be laughable. But at the same time, we have to embrace the flaws. We need to have an attitude like Paul who said, Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I can rejoice. We need to encourage Christian filmmakers to make films that give voice to our faith and expect there to be a learning curve. It's rare that a talented and successful filmmaker in the general market will cross over into the faith market. Most of our filmmakers are homegrown, and we have to be realistic in our expectations so that they have room to grow. Our criticism has a goal, and that is edification. It's not to dwell on past failures. It's to motivate us to expect more and produce better. And I believe my guest, Brett McCracken, would agree. Well, I work full-time for the Gospel Coalition, so I'm kind of rep- representing the West Coast. I'm the only um, full-time editor. I oversee culture and the arts. That's kind of my area of oversight. And you guys are producing a lot of content now. We do, yeah. We have every day we have at least four new pieces of content. And um, yeah, so it's it's a ton of content. It's We're pretty big. I mean, I think the Gospel Coalition is like the something like the 11th most visited Christian website in the world or something like that. Well, that um, wouldn't surprise me. So yeah, it's a fun, fun job. I enjoy it. It's kind of right in the sweet spot of my, my areas of skill and interest and passion. So I grew up in a Christian home in the Midwest, Kansas city, um, pretty conservative Baptist upbringing. Um, but I was always, you know, faithful churchgoer, loved the church, loved faith. I didn't ever kind of go through a um, rebellious kind of leave the church phase. But I also, um, ever since I can remember growing up as a kid, I just loved um, the arts. I loved movies, especially. That was kind of my um, genre of art that I loved the most, but also music and things like architecture and even like painting. My There were art museums that we would go to um, growing up. And uh, so... I would say my two loves in my kind of coming of age years were the arts and culture and the church. And yet I, I felt like they were two different worlds. Like I didn't necessarily see a lot of examples of the two of them coming together. They felt like they weren't really in dialogue with one another. In fact, in fact, I would say the message that I did pick up from church and just from the circles of evangelical culture that I ran in was was that if there was any relationship between the arts and church, it was kind of a contentious one. It was, you know, it was one of fear and what is, you know, Hollywood, what messages are they trying to cram down our throats, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so fast forward to college, I went to Wheaton College. And so coming into Wheaton, um, I was interested in the humanities. I think I started as a literature major, um, but I got I got experience um, with journalism. I was uh, working as an editor um, for the student newspaper, the arts and culture editor, 
And um, so that's kind of where I got my feet wet, um, really digging into like writing about the arts and culture from a Christian perspective. And so these two worlds that felt at odds growing up started to come together. And I started to like catch a vision for how the two of them actually have a lot to say to each other and they can be a really fruitful dialogue. And I had some professors at Wheaton that really modeled it well and encouraged this kind of integration. And um, I, I grew I grew up loving C.S. Lewis and and Tolkien and, and the, yeah. those sort of inkling characters, and I feel like they mm-hmm. mo- they model it well as you know as well this kind of integration. So it was college where I really kind of started devoting myself to the, this like overarching task vocationally, where I just want to help other Christians out there who maybe feel a disconnect or a tension between culture and Christianity to to have a more fruitful integration of those two things. So I do that through um, criticism, through writing about the arts in a, in what I hope is a high level, kind of uh, not just a superficial counting curse words type <laughs> approach, um, <laughs> but actually like a, a meaty engagement with um, the arts from a, from a substantive theological point of view. Um, so, right. so that kind of brings me just fast, forwarding through a lot of stuff to what I do today full-time as the arts and culture editor for the gospel coalition. It's, it's just kind of a dream job because what I do daily, like my job is to, to produce content at this intersection of kind of theology and culture and the gospel and the arts and, and how to do that really well. So I'm constantly pushing myself to raise the bar with that. And, um, uh, it's just, it's enjoyable. I'm getting um, just a lot of great feedback from people all over the world who read the articles that I write and that I edit, um, just saying how beneficial it is for them to see this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of engagement with culture uh, from a Christian perspective. So yeah, that's kind of the the quick version of the story. I, I've written some books along the way, and I went to grad school at UCLA and kind of um, got a master's in film studies there just to kind of oh. just to kind of become even more of an expert um in that area of culture uh that's what now, brought- did you make films there you know i didn't so i i did i i was in the film school but i was in a academic degree program so it was kind of oh. it was looking at film history and theory and criticism um and uh, so i have dabbled in filmmaking you know, a little bit, but pretty early on in college, I realized like I'm more gifted in kind of the critical aspect of engaging film and writing about mm-hmm. it. And I often tell people like, I think we need both in the Christian world. We need people who are modeling excellent making of art and culture, and also people who are modeling excellent consumption of art and culture and, and, doing it and like engaging on that level really well Um, because you you need both like artists need great um, audiences in order to spur them on to kind of um, raise the bar in their own craft and of course audiences need high quality art to to keep inspiring them and getting them to care so it's a it's a symbiotic relationship and so i i teach a little bit um currently i teach a faith and film integration class at Biola university. And so yeah. I'm, I love that because I'm, I'm trying to push students, you know, 18 to 21 year olds today to some of them are going to become filmmakers. Um, uh, some of them are going to become just, you know, maybe film critics or film appreciators, but all of them I think could use, um, just, a, a challenge to raise the bar and, and, and how they think about culture, how they make it, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really big on education and, um, just pushing the Christian world to just a higher caliber of, of all of this. Well, you are a very unique individual to have this kind of outlook and passion. Um, I mean, I, I was just sitting here thinking, I, I've never heard anybody say anything that you're saying. And I'm like, this is so important. Mm. We need people like you to be doing what you're doing. And I'm so glad that you've got this forum at the gospel coalition yeah. uh, to do this. Thank you. Um, you, you must be very aware of Andre Bazin. 
yes. um, yeah. from the French New Wave. And of course. You know, this guy was a critic who mm -hmm. defined an era, mm -hmm. but he never made a film. Right, right. <laughs> Yet he was so important to it. Right. Yeah, he, he was an inspiration for me in grad school because at UCLA in that program, of course, we read, you know, a, a ton of um, theorists like him and the French New Wave and um, Truffaut and all the rest. And, um, and uh, yeah, Bazan is, is always um, inspired me because you're exactly right. He, he was a critic who actually made a huge difference in film history and kind of redefining what film could be and giving an inspiration to the artists themselves, the filmmakers themselves. And so as an, as an example of how critics and creatives can spur each other on, I think that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. I interviewed, I don't know if you've heard the podcast, but I interviewed Dr. Richard Newpert uh, from Georgia. Okay. And uh, he's, he's written a book on the French new wave and translated another volume by another fellow who was an expert on it. Oh, cool. And uh, he, it was really, really enjoyable talking to him about that movement. Yeah. It's such a great movement. It's, it's, I mean, it's one of those things that I wish more um, like Christians would go back and watch this film, especially like, Christian young people who dream of making movies like um, don't just watch Braveheart and you know, the, <laughs> the passion of the Christ. Like you, I often tell my students at Biola, like you need, if you, if you have any hopes of like being a game changing filmmaker in your generation of actually yeah. making a difference, what you need to do is like right now, like go watch all of the like game changing movies from the last hundred years. And that includes, yeah. That includes films from the French New Wave and Italian neorealism and, you know, right. Russian films and <laughs> all sorts of things. Yeah. So, yeah. So what are some of your favorites? I have to ask you. Well, I mean, I love the French New Wave. I think, you know, I love um, Godard and Truffaut and um, uh, Agnes Varda, who just passed away. Um, yeah. And, you know, Italian neorealism is one of my favorites. So like Bicycle Thieves mm -hmm. and yeah you know some of rossini's films um yeah just you, just putting yourselves in kind of the shoes like i think to modern eyes those films don't look revolutionary um necessarily but to go back in time and to see where they were in film history uh, what they were just something new and fresh um hence the name french new wave right it, it was this, yeah. this this new way of making films this free kind of, uh, lightness. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love, I love things in, in any art genre and painting, whatever. I love those periods of transition where there, there was just something new in the air and, um, it was just exciting and people, artists felt free to kind of break out of the conventions. Um, so even something like well, I, yeah. I think that's what's shackling many filmmakers today, even in yeah. Hollywood, is that there's so much convention. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, anything, you, anytime you get involved in any Hollywood websites or whatever, they're pushing all these screenwriting seminars and books and all this stuff. Right. And it's all, con most of it's conventional. Yeah. But then you go back and, and watch these guys who didn't have any of this, right. and their stuff is brilliant. Yeah, I know. It's almost like the over, um, a, this over education we have this glut of information about how to make movies and how to there's like a hundred books on how to write a screenplay that you can choose yeah. from on amazon i almost feel like that's making it worse because yeah um true creativity i think you know flourishes in freedom in the sense of not feeling like you have to follow a certain script a certain formula um not that that's never helpful but uh, you're right. Like if you go back to some of the truly groundbreaking artists and filmmakers, I mean, some of them like had like um, education, like from AFI or something, but a lot of them were just um, daring and, and wanting to experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a, um, I had the chance in grad school to interview Haskell Wexler, the, Oh, wow. The old, um, you know, he was a cinematographer. He was a cinematographer for the most part. Um, but then he made his own films like medium cool. And, yeah. um, yeah, I feel like he's a good example of, he was just like a guy with a camera and like, by 
you know, he just kind of started experimenting with handheld styles and cinema verite and blending um, the kind of styles of uh, Vietnam War footage with like fiction and whatnot. And um, you just, you know, you give just a creative guy a camera and see what they do. And that's exciting. So, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So let's let's turn our attention to Christian film. Okay. Um, what, what do you, what do you see happening in the Christian film world today? <laughs> oh man, this is, this could easily become like a soapbox. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to go off uh, too much, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think Christian film is kind of rightfully a little bit of a whipping boy <laughs> for in the critical world. Like, you know, Christian film does not have a good reputation um, in the world of, film critics um it's stereotypical kind of reputation is uh just very um saccharine and um cheap and um message focused um and i think um i think a lot of that is true you know most of the successful christian movies in the sense of box office success are the ones that are like just so on the nose in terms of here's the message. Like it's almost like a PowerPoint presentation as a film, like God's not dead or something. Um, And uh, so I have, yeah, I have thoughts about why that's kind of the rut of Christian film, this kind of didactic mode. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just the heritage of evangelicalism being, you know, so, um, so oriented around the message, the gospel and, and getting it out, right. getting it out as efficiently as possible, as far and wide as possible, which is a good thing. And, you know, it's, it's been a great impulse for evangelicals that, you know, to utilize media to do that. Um, and Billy Graham did it really well in kind of a revolutionary way in the mid century with utilizing media and films to do that. But I think the, mm-hmm. the downside of that um, impulse, which is a good impulse, is that when it when you apply it across the board to art, to storytelling, it just um, yeah, it just kind of cuts the legs out from under you in terms of, of of making something truly good because art is rarely um, resonant. It's rarely groundbreaking and amazing if it's primarily about translating a message efficiently to um, right. a crowd. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's the big problem I see with Christian movies. They're just kind of stuck in this. Um, it's all about the message. You know, we just have to like have a positive moral message. It needs to come through loud and clear. Um, I think a lot of Christian movies are afraid of ambiguity and kind of leaving things open-ended. Yeah. Um, you know, That's true. so you have a lot of films, Christian films are just kind of end in this like neat, um, every, everything is tied up with a nice bow at the end of the movie. And that might feel satisfying to an audience if you're preaching to the choir, but it doesn't ring true with the human experience. And not, right. that, not that films always need to end on like a downer note. You know, I don't, I don't think the answer for Christian movies is to swing to the other extreme where they're just kind of wallowing in Ecclesiastes all day. But um, I think we have to find this place of tension where uh, I often, um, I go back to a quote from George Steiner, the Jewish literary critic who talks about um, Saturday, you know, we live in the Saturday, like human existence is between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Like Mm. we have the despair of Good Friday on one side, but we also have the the hope and the joy and the jubilation of Easter on the other. Um, But we, but our existence now is in the Saturday and the best art George Steiner says it, you know, is that which kind of leans into and gives voice to that Saturday tension. And so Mm. I think, a lot of Christian art, um, whether it's films or, you know, Thomas Kincaid paintings or whatever music even tends to lean towards Sunday, right? It tends to lean towards the Easter resolution and the kind of Mm. the heavenly vision. 
And um, a lot of the worldly, like indie film, maybe leans towards the Friday. It's it's kind of like right. despairing over the the sin and the depravity of the world. And I think Christian film has an opportunity to like actually like carve out a space that that you feel Friday. You you're realistic about it. You don't you're not Pollyanna ish about Friday, but you also have the hope of, of Sunday. And so you kind of are in this now and not yet tension, which is uh, where we live. And so, right. so when I when I kind of talk about what a Christian aesthetic of film might look like, um, I think Saturday, that tension of Saturday is a key part of it. How do we embody that? How do we manifest that in our filmmaking? Yeah, yeah. I think that's very, very, uh, a very good point. Um, because it's, it separates us as storytellers from the world because we're trying to tell a very different story. And I think we have to do it with very different means. Um, but what I see is that Christian filmmakers tend to follow the convention of Hollywood today. Mm -hmm. And we need to be thinking outside that box. We need to be thinking differently about how we can tell these kinds of stories because ultimately we have a different purpose. Yeah. Yeah, we have a and we have a, a meaning that is transcendent. Like it's uh, and we have an eternal perspective that is just mm-hmm. um, not there in the kind of worldly um, perspective. So yeah, I'm totally with you. I, and I think it is another sad thing about the Christian film that you see is it is very derivative. Like you just said, it tends to take a successful formula that has worked in Hollywood and tried to like copy it, but in a, right. but in a usually less effective way um, yeah. because it's also trying to be didactic and teach a story, teach a moral message along the yeah. way. So, yeah, I think we, you're right. We need to come at, we need to stop just copying Hollywood and, and almost come to this with a fresh, just clean slate of like anything is possible artistically stylistically um let's start with the cross let's start with the trinity let's start with things that we know are true and mm-hmm. go from there how does that shape our storytelling and and the types yeah. of the types of stories we want to tell and the way that we tell them if god's going to raise up a movement in christian film I think it's fair to say that he's also going to raise up people like Brett, who can not only provide thoughtful analysis to the work we produce, but to point us to films outside our genre that we should be learning from. My conversation with Brett will continue in the next episode. Thank you for joining me on the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. You can find show notes and more information about the Ministry of Motion Pictures at ministryofmotionpictures.org. I've also provided links to a select list of Brett's articles on the Gospel Coalition. What we do in life echoes in eternity.